Urban Squeeze. For the first time in 2017, we get the wonderful Dr. Tony Matthews from the School of Environment at Griffith to talk about Let's planning in and around the Littleys, mate. Planning in and around the Littleys, indeed, mm. and uh, how we may be not planning for their needs. Oh, are we going to get a bit controversial? We the might next do. 15 minutes. Let's not rule it out. So. How much thought? Oh, where, where to begin this? Um, we live in a city that has a significant young population, families. Yep. We always hear about the families, uh, the growth of families here on the Gold Coast. How important is it as uh, a piece of the urban planning pie to cater for kids? It's extremely important to cater for children. I mean, if you you mentioned the city, you mentioned Gold Coast or any other community that exists up or down the country. Um, you know, we live in built environments and they condition our needs and our outcomes and our hmm. uh, whether we tr thrive or not. And, and that's no different for children. And one of the difficulties that we've had in this country and indeed in many other countries is a trend away from thinking about the needs of children in an urban context. We, we tend to focus on the needs of other groups. We're very focused, for example, on the needs of elderly people, mm. and rightly so, and disabled people, again, rightly so, and other communities, um, and rightly so as well. But we've tended to move away from thinking specifically about children. There are a number of reasons put forward for that number of arguments. One is that policymakers have tended to overreact to large demographic shifts, like, for example, the growth of small households and increasingly large ageing population. And so what they've done is they've tended to respond to these trends or over respond to them and along the way have sort of lost focus on the needs of children. So while we hear a lot about families and children and so on and so forth, we're not necessarily consciously planning for the needs of children. I suppose a question emerges out of that. Why do the needs of children require extra thought? Very simply, if you're not thinking about the needs of children, then you're not preparing yourself for the future. Simple as that. Simple as that. Who it's... gets it right? Are there examples around the world can you do, of a particularly child-friendly environment? There are child-friendly environments certainly around the place. I mean, let's just keep it local for now. I mean, if you want to look at a very child-friendly uh, environment just here is the... Is, is, is the um, Broadwater Parklands, which yes. is great. It's got everything, right? It's got shading, it's got seating, it's got toilet facilities, it uses the water, it uses the green space, uh, it's got nature, it's got it's supervised, there are playgrounds there. It's That's a really ideal child-friendly you know, child space here on the Gold Coast. There's a few up around Brisbane, places like South Bank. Uh, there's a new development um, at 17 Mile Rocks, uh, kind of a water wading pool, mm -hmm. you know, splash area um, up in Caloundra, those kinds of places. So when we do do it, it tends to often involve water um obviously we're we're pretty good most suburbs do have um playground provision and things like that but the kinds of playgrounds that are provided are often rather than play equipment in the more kind of organic natural sense that children might understand it, it it's very managed equipment designed to minimize risk which comes from a concern about public liability. Mm. So there are cities that do it really well. Places like Vancouver have good reputations. I, I know, for example, as well, uh, uh, in Israel, they're taking child-friendly design very, very seriously um, in some of their cities, uh, again, with this recognition that you're, you're looking at the needs of the future. Okay, so it's, it's like foundation, happy kids, ha strong foundation. Happy, well-educated, well-socialised socialized children that are able to indulge in a sense of adventure in their play, that are able to have imaginative play, that can interact with nature, you know, that are, you know, children are, who are able to go outside and play in relative safety. Mm. I mean, you just take for one example, look at how cars dominate almost everything. You know, you, you wouldn't necessarily feel all that comfortable about your children playing on the street anymore. I mean, you and I probably grew up playing on the street, right? But there were a lot fewer cars around back then. I have the joys of a cul-de-sac. Well, so, yeah, yeah, things are a little different for things me. Things might be, but many people don't have that privilege. Mm. And worse again, there's an awful lot of new um, housing estates, particularly ones that have been master, master planned or de developed in the last 20 years that don't have even footpaths. Mm. And, mm. You know, so where where does, for example, somebody... Um, walk if they're walking with their children you know say you're pushing a stroller or a pram or something like that or you're walking with a three or four year old you know holding their hand if you don't have a footpath you're walking along the road that's not safe and it's not meeting their needs and you can't ride your skateboards or your bikes on the footpath and etc et etc et exactly and it's all problematic so you know once you think of it on the kind of fine scale you start to see where we're where we're leaving things out you we were talking about uh, open space and 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 parklands and the opportunities to socialize and and uh, and play safely if you like like in an organic environment, one of the great frustrations I have as a as a parent mm. uh, here on the Gold Coast, and I think of one uh, one specific example at the southern end of the coast, in and around Palm Beach. Great 
park, great space, um, wonderful uh, playground facilities, baking in the sun with limited shade and limited opportunities to escape the heat. And you just sort of think, ugh, wasted opportunity. That was the sound of me slapping my forehead, by the way. Face palm slap. Um, wasted opportunity. I couldn't agree more with you. And I, I, I actually, that's something that I did highlight in, in, in my notes um, for today is that uh, heat stress, you know, particularly given the, the hot weather we've had for the last few weeks, that's, in, you know, really exacerbated by a lack of shading. And so there's no point in providing facilities for anybody, frankly, outdoor facilities, outdoor recreation facilities for adults or children uh, if you're not going to provide adequate shading. And like your example there, there was a new playground went in not too far from where I live uh, about a year ago and I'd say it was another six months before they put the shading up. Mm -hmm. so the whole playground was there for six months ready to go and open but the shading came six months later and I just couldn't figure that. <laughs> Scratching your head. Uh, Tony Matthews, Dr. Tony Matthews is from the School of Environment at Griffith University Urban Squeeze talking urban planning but how well perhaps we don't factor in the needs of kids as best we might. Is that where we're heading this afternoon, Tony? Um yeah, I mean, w w there was a book came out about 12 years ago, um, which sold very well in this country. It was called Children of the Lucky Country, and it was one of the first um, popular texts, you know, outside of academic writing that really took a look at this experience of children in, in cities and communities. And um, and the argument that they made was that the, the experiences and the needs of children were being underrepresented by and large, not in every case, but in many cases, or all of their needs were not being adequately met. Um, and they identified several reasons for that. Um, I can go through some of them. Yeah, with you. I do. Um, so, for example, we've already touched on it walking and cycling are frequently unsafe because of the primacy given to cars and heavy traffic. Um, even I don't cycle anymore because I'm just sick of, you know, f feeling like my life is in my hands. I wouldn't want to be a five or six year old trying to navigate the same roads. Mm. Uh, heat stress exacerbated by poor shading. And that's not just shading in play spaces. That's also street shading uh, provided by trees and things like that. Myself and Jason touched on, on that. We did an episode on that last year, if you remember. Um, lack of footpaths. We've talked about that. Um, green spaces are reducing. So what we're seeing is when new housing developments are being developed, the lot sizes are reducing, the volume of housing is increasing, and green space is also often reducing as well, public green space, that is, so mm. a play space in the middle of an area. Um, street play is either discouraged or illegal in many cases. Uh, a lot of children now are growing up. In illegal? In, in what sense? Oh, in, in the, in the, well, particularly in, in, in like body corporate developments are particularly bad for this. So if you think about a lot of the new housing that has been delivered in all Australian cities over the last five years has been, um, you know, has been delivered under the auspices of this idea of urban consolidation. So it's more houses and less space, a lot of infill development, less greenfield development. And so what you have is when you when you have um, these 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 gated communities or these townhouse communities, they often have a body corporate management system. Um, within. So they're sort of self-managed uh, through a board and that board sets down rules that residents have to adhere to and often those rules are very uh, unkind to children including uh, no playing in the street. Now this is a private road generally so mm. no kicking a football out there. No pets so children are denied the opportunity to have a dog or a cat. Again you know if you go to if you go and you read the research having a, a pet um, in any household is actually a positive thing generally for people's health and mental well-being and physical well-being um, even more so for children. So those kinds of, of things are very discriminatory uh, in a sense as well. Um, developers have created a huge market for two-bedroom apartments which are not in suitable for most families and um, they seem to be under the impression that there's a, a massive population of you know sort of uh, <laughs> couples with money no children um, you know we, we, we don't necessarily we, we're also seeing a trend towards bigger houses or occupying more of a, a block space so smaller gardens which means that there's no outdoor space around the house for children to play in so they come inside so mm. they're, you know they, they're on, generally they're not playing the same way when they're indoors and that has its own health implications as well um, level footpaths things like that um, something else that we probably, you know, that I, I will give a nod to is, is talking about the needs of children in cities and communities. We're also even worse, arguably, at thinking about the needs of teenagers. Gee, OK. I hadn't thought of that because yeah. teenagers are a little more self-sufficient, perhaps, and don't require uh, that kind of planning, mollycoddling, if they, you like. But, not to the same degree, but, yeah. you know, there's this kind of, the, the, you, you tend to have this social anxiety about gangs of mooching teenagers yes, around yes. the place. And, you know, if you ever actually stop to ask them what would they like to be able to do with their time, you know, they'll have pretty inventive suggestions, perhaps. 
you know, they can't do what their older peers do. So, for example, things like the pubs, you know, nightclubs, all that sort of mm. stuff, they can't do that. And they're too old for the stuff that smaller kids are doing. So they're in this kind of odd middle space. where There, they... there does seem to be this trend towards, oh, how can we occupy uh, the mooching youth? Yeah. Uh, we'll build a skate park without shade. <laughs> yes, and, and <laughs> then we'll, we'll heavily regulate it and we'll, 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 we'll run it for according to mm. certain hours where it's open and closed and then we'll, you know, we'll get upset when they, when they mm. try and imprint their own ownership and identity on it by you know, spray painting it and things like that. You know, if you're going to build a skate park, expect graffiti. That's sort of part of the package. You know? <laughs> it sort of goes that way, doesn't it? So what can we do to improve the lot of children in cities and specifically here on the Gold Coast? Well, one really good start, and this is, you know, this is pointed out by a variety of thinkers right from UNICEF at the international level down. Um, the first thing that we can do, the first really positive thing we can do is actually ask children and adolescents, what do you want? Consult with them. We, we have consultation, community consultation, public consultation on just about every planning endeavour that we have, but we don't specifically generally seek the opinions of children. So you can actually give them an opportunity to tell you what they need. So that's a really valuable thing to do. Now, you might say, well, can't a planner imagine or can't an urban designer imagine what a child needs? Maybe they can, but there's nothing like first-hand knowledge. So you ask a bunch of, you know, a cross-section of children from whatever age, you know, I suppose by the, you know, three or four, was four maybe, as soon as they can really articulate themselves up to whatever your cutoff point is. And you, you do focus groups with them. You give them paper and pencils and you ask them to draw the things that they want or write down the things that they want. Or, you know, there's a, we, we do market research for just about everything else, right? Mm. But we don't do market research with children when we're designing the spaces we expect them to live in. I suppose the emphasis has become on, we know what is best for you. Exactly. We, we've experienced childhood we now know what is best for you and it removes a question from the process. Yeah. Now that's just a very paternalistic view of things and it's not a fair way to look at the experiences of children. It's not fair to them. Yeah. Um, what about urban planners in this? You, you obviously uh, have given it some thought and consideration. Are you doing enough to agitate for better outcomes for kids? I'm not sure that the profession is doing enough to agitate. Um, for example, the, I mean, there's some good work going on, and, and I'm happy to talk about that. The, we have our professional representative body is the Planning Institute of Australia. I'm a member of it. Most planners are. Uh, now, the PIA, as they're known, um, PIA, um, they actually have a child-friendly communities policy, and they have a whole set of policy principles, and they have a whole set of advocacy uh, principles as well around child-friendly communities. Mm. Um, so it is well recognized within the professional community that the needs of children are not necessarily being met and could be met in better ways through existing planning processes. But the difficulty is that the average planner is sort of in the middle of the development chain, not at the top of it. So, you know, if, if for example, a new master plan comes before them, you know, somebody's going to build 500 housing units um, on the other side of the highway, um, they've master planned it. Very often, the the urgency uh, among senior policymakers or senior political figures is to actually have the stock delivered, not necessarily to have it delivered in the most optimal sense. And often, the developer is trying to deliver it in some way that makes it cost effective and profit effective to them. And you know that's what so everybody's doing their job in a sense. Now the planners in the middle trying to mediate this, mm. and planners are not really decision makers. People tend to make that mistake. Planners are not decision makers. What we do is make recommendations for best practice, but how we proceed or how development ultimately articulates after that point is is often in the hands of other decision makers and many of them are not trained professionals um, they don't necessarily understand space or the needs of people that use space they look perhaps at the planner's recommendations and the planner can make all kinds of recommendations that are child friendly mm. but those recommendations may not be carried. It comes down to priorities yeah. and the economics of certain things, I guess. Too. It does, it does. And unfortunately, you know, we, we're, we're, in, we're in a phase of social and urban development where we're, there's a big emphasis on materialism and individualism and, and the needs of children and adolescents are falling away to some degree because of this. Mm. But, you know, there are ways that we can intervene. We can do things about this. You know, very small scale stuff, like turn your street into a playground by hanging a swing from a tree. Mm -hmm. You know, you'd be amazed how many children will start using that. You know, that'll become a focal point. I think there's some sort of council officer in some, in an office somewhere at the moment, looking up a rule book and thinking, "Hang on, isn't there a liability attached to that?" Probably, or else he's looking for the business case, either or, <laughs> or both. <laughs> With apologies to our good friends in council. The council, yes. Um, protected street space would be really useful. You, you mentioned it earlier about skating and, and scooting mm. and things like that, but you know. 
slightly separated space where children can do that when they're on the move with their parents. So particularly along shopping streets and things like that, you know, we segregate pavements already, if you think about it. I mean, we allow restaurants to put street seating outside mm -hmm. and, and, and tables and things like that. But we don't generally segregate streets for the needs of children. So if we if we had narrow channels and they need only be a meter or a meter and a half wide where children can safely skate or, or bike alongside their parents as their parents are moving up and down the street. Mm. Um, you know, it doesn't have to be everywhere, but on streets, they get a lot of pedestrian traffic like shopping streets. That That's a, a really good idea. Um, uh, plentiful crosswalks that are done playfully with colorful designs uh with colorful paint um they're really helpful what do you mean crosswalks oh what? like pedestrian crossings. pedestrian crossings yeah. okay yeah yeah so um you know pedestrian crossings can often be pretty hard to find if they exist at all um you know if, if children are going to cross the street you obviously you want to minimize the risk of them just trying to run between traffic so the the more pedestrian crossings you have the better now if mm. you can make those visually appealing you have two benefits. One is children are more inclined to use them and two, um, car drivers and other um, uh, traffic will, will recognise them as being unusual and uncommon and will respond a little bit more actively to them than, you know, you, well, you know yourself, anyone who drives knows that there's a certain amount of unconscious driving goes on and things like crosswalks, you start to just, the, you know, your peripherals will pick up the black and white. Yes, but if yes. that was yellow and red, for example, you'd see it much more vividly, as would a child, you know, from their level. Yeah, there are places elsewhere that do it differently? I'm sure that there are, yeah, all over the world, um, but not so much. I haven't seen it so much on the Gold Coast yeah, or in South East Queensland. Parts. What about chicanes and, and speed bumps and things like that in streets, to uh, things to slow cars down to allow children a little more breathing space, if you like? They do allow children a little bit more breathing space, but I, you know, my suspicion, Matt, is that a lot of the time they're put in because residents get agitated by people speeding at night. By cars, cars. By comes cars, back to cars. And hooning and things like that. Mm. Um, whether or not it's actually hooning, it gets called hooning and, and pressure comes on the local councillor to do something about it. I'll give you an interesting example. Um, I live on a residential street and there's a residential street parallel to me. They have chicanes and traffic calming on the one parallel to me and what that has done is that has pushed all of the speeding nighttime traffic onto my street so you'll hear them whizzing past mm. and it's i mean it's, it's a quiet residential street it's the road to nowhere but yet they do it so you know the other guys agitated first and they got the the stuff we get the heavy traffic now or the speeding traffic you know i don't whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. I remember the street I was growing up in as a kid. Uh, it was one of those extended speed humps, if you like, a hump at either end, flat part in the middle. And we used to uh, weave along the sloped part, the rise or the the the, uh, the other end of it, uh, on our skateboards, pretending it was a wave sort of thing. It was a play thing, essentially. Yeah, we, we, we used to do the same. And, and we used to have a, a street when I was growing up, um, where we would skateboard it had a great hill on it and eventually the ramps came along and you know and then what happened is a couple of people took hoppers off the ramps <laughs> and they were public liability problems yes, and, and, you know, and so. on and on it goes yeah so there's a lot to think about isn't there there is there is and as i say when and you break a it, lot not to think not about, to think too. about. Yeah. But when you break it down to the fine grain you you start to see where we're mm. perhaps where we could be doing much better you know mm. well let's hope some people are listening Let's hope so. And start to agitate. Word of the afternoon. Uh, thank you so much. Good to see you again for 2017. And Great to be back. And thanks to everybody that tunes into us, that tuned in last year and is tuning in this year. We're super excited to be back with you. Good on you. Tony Matthews, Dr. Tony Matthews, a lecturer in urban and environmental planning, School of Environment at Griffith University.